Good morning, Jags. This is Fahad. Today is Thursday, November 12th. Let's get started. This is NASDAQ chart in front of you. And right now it's flat, pretty much exactly flat, or you could say it's up four or five points. And then if you go over and take a look at the Russell 2000 uh, futures, you will see that's down 1%. And if you look at the overnight session, you will see that when the European markets were open at three o'clock in the morning, the Russell 2000 index was the weakest of all. It was hitting as low as 1716, and we're sitting just above that. So I want to see if the Russell 2000 index will start to take out the the intra-session low that we saw yesterday, as well as the overnight session low that we saw. So 1715 is the level here to, to watch. If you look at IWM, I mentioned this in the chat room yesterday that this gap will get filled in IWM. So IWM closed at 172 yesterday, and I think it's going to come in and it's going to fill that gap down to 163 to 164 level which is the major VOP support level. So on a percentage basis, I believe there's about four to 5% decline coming in IWM. So I would expect that to happen. Now, keep in mind, why did Russell 2000 index broke out sharply on Monday? It was entirely driven by this hopes of vaccine from Pfizer, which showed 90% effectiveness. And the preliminary data that came out from Moderna last night also seems to be quite promising. But here is the problem. I'm trying to balance what is clearly very, very good news on the vaccine front from Pfizer and Moderna, and there could be more like Oxford study that could be coming out in the next couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months. But make no mistake, this good news is still far away from actually coming to the market. All right. And then the, I'm trying to balance that optimism in the market, particularly related to small and mid cap stocks, to what is clearly uh, a pretty bad situation appearing with raging coronavirus everywhere. I want to show you what we're seeing in coronavirus trends, as well as how that's starting to translate into consumer spending habits. So here is the United States daily new cases. 142,000 new cases yesterday, which was just about as bad as the prior day, also above 140,000. This chart is just absolutely ripping higher as we go into the winter months. And then if you look over and take a look at the mortality rate, which is on a percentage basis is clearly down a lot from April high. Nevertheless, this is also starting to push higher. 1,400 people died in the United States from COVID-19 yesterday. And the day prior to that was also just as bad. This, this number continues to push up. We're probably gonna start to see this thing go all the way up to 2000 per day, all right? Then now is this a starting to have an impact on the consumer spending? So what I did was I looked at some research. So first I went to, um, uh, I went to the uh, open table reservation system which is which provides pretty good channel checks and here what we find out if we go down across and we look at how the overall dining reservations is taking place and what's happening to the actual trend for all the major cities you will see a trend over here that is pretty clear so for example if you go back to the october month you look at atlanta you will see that we were starting to see the year over year uh, de decline in the Atlanta restaurant reservations to be about 35 to 40 percent. In the last couple of days, it started to get pretty worse. It's pretty bad from 30 percent decline to minus 46 percent to minus 60, 66 percent and such and such. If you go down further, you will see same thing is happening in Boston. If you go down to Chicago, Chicago is now back to minus 90 percent decline on a year over year basis in the restaurant reservation versus in October, we were seeing a minus 75% decline. And in the month of before that, if you go back to September and August, we were seeing minus 60% decline. Just go down the list and you will see all of them. Uh, Dallas is getting worse, now back to minus 50%. Houston, is, Houston was down in the mid-teens at one point, and now it's down minus 45% uh, year over year. 
uh, Indianapolis, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, minus 70%. It's just, you just go down the list and you will see all of these major cities getting. San Francisco is now minus 82%, worse from the average reading that we saw in October of minus 71%. Seattle is minus 84%. So the point here is that this is clearly starting to show up in the consumer psyche and in the mentality whether people want to go out and eat in restaurants again. And turns out that Bank of America Research Note is also starting to pick up this very trend in their most recent Bank of America debit and credit card checks. So here's a quote from Bank of America most recent research. They say, it is, it is more apparent when zooming in on brick and mortar spending, which is running at minus 4.4% year over year for the hotspots, down from or worse from minus 1.1% two weeks ago. Next, we look at Illinois, which has stood out relative to other states in putting in place stringent policies. We see clear evidence of weakening in restaurant spending in the state, but minimal effects on other types of spending so far. So they're also starting to pick up this in their channel checks for debit and credit card. Here's another chart that comes from Bank of America, in which you can see over here too, where, for example, the total spending on airlines was at minus 60% just until two weeks ago, and now it's at minus 65%. The entertainment sector, which would include, I would assume, theaters and all kinds of sporting events and such and such, was down to minus 40%, and now it's back to, now it's, now it's down minus 73%. Restaurants, same way, continues to gradually get worse transit. And overall, all of these numbers are slowly starting to show more and more red from light red or yellow or green just up until a couple of weeks ago. All right. And what's picking up? As you would imagine, as more people stay at home, and as we saw this previously in the months throughout in the months of summer as well, the work from home crowd pushes the online electronic sales higher. So you're starting to see that actually starting to accelerate, which is which is bullish for Corsair Gaming, which is which is bullish for Logitech, which is bullish for a lot of those kind of companies. Same trends, not to an extreme extent, but the trends are definitely appearing. So the question that really comes down to my mind is what does this mean for names like Dave & Buster's, which is spiked sharply all the way to above $25 per share after that uh, Pfizer data came out and immediately started to fade. Maybe this thing, will, this thing will go back to $15 per share. What does this mean for Cheesecake Factory? Why is Cheesecake Factory still, you know, back to pre-COVID level, back to February level in such an environment? Maybe this will continue to fade from here. Similarly, you go down the list. What does this mean for BLMN, Blooming Brands, which has a large wedge formation and potentially is going to break down from this wedge through $14 per share? What does this mean for Cracker Barrel, another restaurant operator? What does this mean for uh, Darden restaurant. If you notice carefully from that very large spike on Monday from that poll that was after Pfizer news, all of these stocks, restaurant stocks are continuing to fade gradually. And I expect that to continue today with Russell 2000 futures right now down 1.1%. And so there are plays over here, and we have been making those plays, but you need to watch carefully what's happening and try to balance out clearly the positive news of vaccine development versus what is a raging virus sweeping across the country with no national policy from the Trump administration who has gone silent on the topic. And whatever Biden is going to do isn't going to be affected until he takes the office on January 20th. So that's a high level view on IWM. I do want to touch real quick on a couple stocks. Most importantly, uh, Trupanion, T-R-U-P. As you know that we are very bullish on this stock and ahead of last earnings report, which came out on October 29th, I recommended buying diagonal call spread, which turned out to be a fantastic trade. We all made an absolute killing on this name and the stock ripped higher from low 70s all the way to 90 plus in the matter of just three to four days post earnings. This stock is getting hit sharply in pre-market. It's going to gap down by about seven to eight percent. It's coming, it's back down to 77 to 78 dollars per share. And I believe this is presenting yet another buying opportunity. Why is this down? Because we have another competitor. 
Walmart is now launching new pet care service and it continues to expand full suite of pet offerings. One of those pet offerings is going to be Walmart Pet Insurance. This news came out right at eight o'clock Eastern time this morning. So this is the Walmart Pet Care Insurance call. Uh, I don't know if there's a specific name for it. They just call it Walmart Pet Insurance, I guess, or Walmart Pet Plan. But this was announced this morning. I haven't had a chance to dive into this, so I, I don't quite know exactly uh, what the price points are or anything, but this will definitely affect uh, Trupanion. But as I've said many times before, when Zoetis also announced similar kind of uh, move into the pet insurance market previously and the stock came down sharply, that presented a buying opportunity for Trupanion. And I expect this will be the same case simply for the fact that people continue to um, um, miss the big picture, which is that only 2% penetration in the United States. And there is room for this industry to continue to grow for a long, long period of time. And there's room for multiple players. It doesn't all have to go to one single player. All right. <clears throat> so there's that. Also, I would like to quickly bring up um, SDGR, uh, Schrodinger. Schrodinger is gapping higher sharply. I own this stock um, and this thing closed at 51 and change and it's going to pop about three to four percent in pre-market and I'm I'm watching whether this thing is going to run back to 60 plus and break out through that. The company is reporting earnings this morning which are very very good. They reported third quarter sales of 25.8 million which was 29 percent year over year and about 10 percent above the consensus view. The software revenues, which is the biggest bullish piece for this company, drove the majority of the beat, which was up 42% year over year and about 15% uh, above the consensus. Gross margins were flat sequentially at 59%. However, the gross, profit, gross margins for software was the strongest piece at um, at uh, 81%. Overall, very, very good quarter. The conference call is actually starting right now at 8.30 a.m. Right now it's 8.29 a.m. So we will get a lot more color on the guidance and what the outlook looks like. So we'll have that discussion later. But nice to see this thing start to pop a little bit in pre-market. So keep an eye on SDGR. All right, that's it from me, Jay. Morning, Fahad. Uh, so actually, I have three topics to talk about today, and I'll go quickly on them. Uh, the first one uh, is going to be about restaurants. Now I'm going to send you a quick image. <clears throat> um, so actually, on October 27th, um, we actually talked about the state of Illinois, um, specifically Cook County, um, and their you know closing plans essentially, and just highlighting that uh, noodles. Um, is the most exposed, uh, you know, for that category. Um, and then separately, yesterday, Truist was out with a note um, taking a look at the state of California. Now, overall, when you look at restaurants in that state, um, companies like El Pollo Loco, which has 80% of their stores in the state, uh, Jack in the Box has 42%. Um, Wingstop has 24% and then Denny's has 24%. Um, Truist then focused on LA County and the uptick in cases there. And um, essentially, you know, you, you can see the, the chart there. Um, and in their coverage, the higher new case count will impact uh, three specific stocks. And that's Denny's because 5.8% of US stores are in LA County followed by IHOP, uh, which is under the Dine Brands uh, name, uh, D-I-N is the ticker on that one, and then Dave & Buster's at 3.6%. So just kind of continuing with, with what you talked about, just some more specific examples from California and Illinois. Yeah, it's not a good picture for restaurants, clearly. Now, they will all can basically depend on on kind of food services, basically to continue to drive their business. But that only picks up so much, you know, the main because they're still not able to sell drinks, which is always a high margin business. A, a typical bar can, you know, a, a, a beer that costs a dollar in gross, you know, in, in cost can sell the beer for six to seven dollars. They're not making those as, you know, deliveries through food services companies. So it has a huge impact on a lot of these restaurants. Yeah. All right. 
Uh, secondly, Walmart. Um, so la actually in the month of September, uh, Walmart launched their Walmart Plus. Uh, it's their new membership program. Uh, and that went for $98 annual fee. Um, BMO Capital was out with a note yesterday um, highlighting their survey results. Um, that suggests that the initial signups for Walmart Plus memberships may be ahead of investor expectations. Uh, based on their survey, 16% of respondents had already signed up for the membership, um, and applying that ratio to the 119 million households in the U.S., this could imply 19 million household memberships thus far. Um, now, it was considered a good value for that $98 annual fee, but 74% still want more from the membership, and they suspect that there will be more to come in the form of additional partnerships, special discounts, priority delivery slots. And then lastly, while grocery is clearly the, the primary category Walmart Plus members are interested in, they were pleasant, BMO was pleasantly surprised to see the higher margin home and apparel categories being shopped by 58% and 42% of members respectively. And uh, they see that as a major advantage for Walmart relative to other pure play grocery stores. Simple math here. So 19 million people have already signed up to Walmart Plus. Walmart Plus was announced only three months ago, four months ago. If I take the 19 million multiply by $98 per year, that's $1.9 billion. And it all drops to the bottom line of the company. To the, uh, to the operating income line. I mean, I understand there's some shipping part of it and all the overhead costs and every single thing, but a very large majority of it actually drops to the bottom line for the company. And I do think this 90 million will go up all the way up to 50 million plus, but potentially in the next couple of quarters. And that's why I remain very, very bullish on Walmart. So interesting update over there. And I think that now that we know this, this should become a hot topic and a positive tone for this earnings report that's coming out next week. I think it was it's on November 17th. So I'm very bullish now on this stock. This update helps me that and the stock should gradually go to 155 to 160. And then uh, lastly, um, I'm going to do a homepage write up on Fubo TV, uh, ticker yeah. FUBO. Um, I know I know you're interested in this stock. I know we've had some questions from clients on it. Um, they did report earnings yesterday. It looked, um, the stock gapped higher, but it looks like it uh, it pulled back though. Um, now I haven't had the chance to really look at the numbers yet, um, but just looking at some of the post earnings notes that I see from Needham, Roth, Oppenheimer. Um, one of the items that they do mention is sports betting. Um, and if I go back to BMO's initiation note, they essentially call sports betting a, a free call option for this stock. Um, now this is a, a live streaming platform. Um, so you know, I'm gonna be interested to see not only the, uh, the numbers, but then just kind of going back to the initiation notes and, and uh, seeing everything that this company has in store. Yeah, I wanted to actually take a position and call options going into this earnings report, but I felt it was the first quarter since the company went public. Ignore all of this price action. This was when the company merged with the SPAC. It has really has been, it really started trading beginning from October 8th. So it had been out only for a month and I wanted to see at least one quarter before I take any interest. And now we know the stock did fade quite a bit yesterday mm -hmm. um, after popping sharply to 20. But um, there's there's pretty strong potential here, you know, especially the company's exposure is pretty strong in the Northeast. And I think sports betting that you're talking about could also be very positive. Strong growth report yesterday. So looking forward to your article. Good stuff. Chronicle. Morning, Fahad. I have a Jaguar Media update this morning. I, and I also have a long idea after that. Uh, first thing is, I'm currently working on a standalone Jaguar Media presentation to talk about a recent IPO called Eargo, symbol E-A-R, which we, we've gotten questions on uh, from our clients. This company makes high-tech ear hearing aids um, that are not very visible when they're worn and are customizable with a mobile app. And this app also provides access to licensed hearing professionals as well as customer care. So. Very interesting company with uh, promising growth projections. So the video is going to be sort of a primer on the company and also a um, 
a summary of what cell side is saying about it in their initiation notes. I'm aiming to have that ready by next week. This could be quite disruptive. Um, you know, it's funny because in America, the hearing aids cost a ton of money. I mean, I don't know why they are so expensive, but they run several thousands of dollars. I mean, I don't know how expensive this is, but uh, uh, this could disrupt that entire market. So should be an interesting one to look at. Next one. Um, second thing is I have a long idea and full disclosure, I bought a small position yesterday and depending on how shares react after the company reports, I may or may not add to it or I might have to ask, exit with a loss uh, if it doesn't go the way I expect it to, so who knows. But the company is GameStop. Now this is a bit of a contrarian one because it's a very hated company on Wall Street because for one thing, this is a component of the toxic brick and mortar space. It's also been heavily loss making over the last couple of years um, and it's been suffering from spiraling revenue. So it, it pretty much goes against the very principles that we're used to at Jaguar Analytics, which is to be long high quality companies with track record of solid growth accompanied by upcoming catalysts and unusual options flow. So why am I saying GameStop could be along here? Several reasons. First of all, Microsoft launched their new Xbox two days ago. And, uh, and then Sony is launching its PlayStation 5 today. Now, one thing we need to keep in mind is that both Sony and Microsoft are selling fully digital versions of their consoles. So um, there are gonna be some people who don't really care about collecting discs. And this is basically why GameStop recently went into a digital revenue sharing agreement with Microsoft so that um, you know they don't miss out if people start leaning um, towards digital downloads for their games instead of discs. But still, if we if we look at this graph of historical sales of some of their most popular consoles in past years, I think it's the first chart with the dark background. Um, we, we can see that sales tends to be more or less steady even long after the launch. But now if we look at forward revenue consensus estimates, which is the, the second chart, um, I think there's a disconnect here because they're basically modeling a, a big initial spike um, but then after that, they're only expecting revenue to uh, grow between 10 to 15% for subsequent quarters next year. I think these, these estimates are too low if we take into account um, the, this digital revenue sharing agreement with Microsoft and all the new gen games um, and also past sales trajectories of previous consoles. And even though GameStop and Sony haven't announced a digital partnership yet, um, consensus believes that it could happen down the road. Um, like if we go back to um, 2013, when the uh, PS4 first launched and 2006, when the PS3 launched, if we look at the following years, um, it's not as if GameStop's revenue fell off a cliff all of a sudden. In fact, if we go back and look at GameStop's numbers, the years after the console launches have seen revenues accelerate, not slow. And, and this time around, the company has a much better e-commerce infrastructure. For the most recent quarter, um, GameStop's e-commerce sales rose 800%, representing 20% of sales. So that's point number one. Now, point number two, um, this is very much a consensus short. Like if we look at the short interest, we currently have over 35 short volume ratio. So at this point, we're just looking for any excuse to have a short squeeze. You know, all it, all it could take um, is for the company to put out a press release or filing saying we achieved record console sales or something along those lines on Black Friday or even Christmas. And also, if we start to get more social distancing uh, because of the pandemic, I think that's a positive because one of the themes I, I think is going under the radar currently is increased rates of mental depression and anxiety from all the solitude. I think this need to relieve stress is a significant reason behind increased demand for digital gaming, online shopping, even domestic pets. Um, and my last point, point number three, is that during this pandemic period, the company did not issue shares. And in fact, they continued to pay down debt. And so if the company manages to recapture some of their past sales declines during the periods without a console, then as the share price attempts to recover to past levels, my point is that there's not going to be any price discounting effect from any dilutions. Um, they also have over $700 million in cash and equivalents accompanied by positive cash flow. So I think it's not likely they're going to do any raises going forward either. So on balance of probability, there won't be any overhang with regards to this.
Okay, so I'll give you my quick thoughts. Uh, I will let you run yourself with this long idea, and I hope you make money on this one because I have my doubts. I'm a bit skeptical on 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 the thing because for the number one reason is that um, as far as uh, the actual consoles being sold as the driver of the performance for the stock itself, yes, that will certainly help. We saw this after Nintendo Switch was launched many years ago and other other times when large important consoles have been launched, there's a bump that company sees. It sees a little bit of a spike in the same store sales growth and all of this. Uh, but keep in mind that was all before pandemic though. Nevertheless, we do see that spike. Who knows, maybe this time it will help this stock once again. But really, uh, the the secular pressure, mounting secular pressure from all the games moving from physical discs to digital gaming, is the is the is the key reason why the short interest has always remained so elevated in this stock, and any kind of a sharp rally has always resulted in fading action over months and quarters to come. And so, for that reason, for a long, long period of time, I mean, you can, you can go back last five, six years when I've actually taken uh, short positions in GameStop for that very reason, because I use the opportunity once the stock has run up quite a bit to basically fade it because the secular pressures are not going away. And I really still don't see those going away this time either. In fact, if one thing that will probably happen after the PS5 and the new Xbox comes out is that the these, these very secular pressures with the shift to digital games gaming will get more pronounced because of the technology moving forward in that direction at an expedited pace. And so those two game consoles may actually just, just end it completely for any kind of physical disc sales. And so what does company do in that such environment? It's something that is still to be determined. So um, an interesting counter trend or, uh, or, uh, or the argument, but I think that a bump may not last for too long. And that's just my personal view. Um, in the in as 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 these games are launched and the consoles are launched all right that's it from us we're going to stop over here and we'll see you in the chat room shortly